All right, boys, you've had a full month trying out Air More and seeing how powerful they aren't. Have you ever thought to yourself, what if there was a better way? What if there was a more superior undead nation in the Middle Age? That's why we're here today to talk about Middle Age Scalaria, and we're going to show you what the undead should be like. All right, let's get this show on the road with a national overview. Scalaria, obviously a splintered empire of the great empire of Airmor, even though they're better at Airmor things than Airmor is. The big thing about Scalaria is that they are an income-based Airmor. It's, since we've already done an Airmor guide, which I highly recommend watching before watching this one because I'm going to be referencing it a lot, they are very much like Airmor, but with a solid, strong income. And lots and lots of forts, just like Airmor, lots and lots of temples, just like Airmor. But the primary difference is that you have the ability to do both. You have the ability to get rich, which enables you to build a ton of castles and temples much faster than Airmore. You have the ability to free spawn faster than Airmore, given enough of a infrastructure setup. And so Scalaria is essentially the better Airmore. As much as it drives me nuts, it just requires a little more micromanagement, and then it's better than Airmore in virtually every single way. And it counters Airmore. If you're ever in a game with Airmore and Scalaria, do not focus the Airmore. Trust me on that one. You will lose to the Scalaria if you do not treat them like you would Dominions 4 Airmore. The primary setup of Scalaria, men and undead, don't need supplies. This is specifically once you get your undead setup going on. Everybody knows you get some undead hordes, human legionnaires. Your troops aren't bad. If you look through like the Velites and the legionnaires, they're solid troops for decently cheap price. The only thing that's ramped up is the resources, which I love that on a nation because that makes it so it's only a tiny bit more expensive. You know, maybe goes up one gold, but you get a lot better gear by paying in resources. That's something that's nice. Principe, solid stat line for humans. Priorius, even though they're old, they're formation fighters, good protection, long spears for repel. Praetorian guards, I mean, maybe as a bodyguard, because bodyguards in the Middle Ages is very important since you have so many really talented assassins running around. Something to consider for that. Otherwise, I wouldn't really buy them. Standards, they're okay. You can throw in a little morale bonus here and there. I like their combat speed is eight, which matches not them, not them, because they're old, but all the regular aged infantry so they don't go running off and getting chopped up ahead of time you have a huge upside in this nation that airmore doesn't have airmore is weak to early rushes scalaria isn't and the primary reason are these two guys the retarius and the gladiator gladiator does have two attacks with his flail which is good it's beneficial it's nice getting two attacks off but it's blunt head damage you know, so it does a little extra damage to the head before armor is deducted, but if they're not getting headshots, it's not as good, or I should say it's not as generalized in purpose as the Retarius, or Retiarius, I guess is the way to pronounce it. These guys have a net, which is great against high defense thugs or sacred rushes, and the Trident does 22 piercing damage which is absolutely bonkers early game. Now the obvious downside, I'm pretty sure everybody knows, but once these guys get wounded or hit somebody else in battle, they disappear. They basically quit after the battle. So they'll fight in the battle, but as, if they participate in the battle, they will disappear. So that's part of the reason why they're so darn cheap. 10 gold and one resource, you can produce a whole heck of a lot of these guys really quickly. And it's a really good thing to start doing if you're facing knights or cavalry during expansion. Crank out 10 to 20 of these guys really rapidly in one turn, throw them in the back of your army just behind your front line holders, and have these guys run up and just start annihilating those cavalry. Really good strategy, helps you out a lot. Slingers, never ever buy these, just don't. I've seen a lot of memes, people trying to do slingers. I've seen them in my multiplayer games, people try to do slingers and throw flaming arrows on them and similar things, it doesn't work as well as you'd think. It's just not as good as it used to be. They're not cheap enough is what it is. If you get something that's like way cheaper than this and you can mass it, sure, you can do tons of damage mid game, but slingers just, there's no advantage to slingers anymore. I just don't like them. When we're looking at our sacreds, we have the Lictor, which has the same problem Airmorian Lictor has, which is no helmet, no hat. And then it has an extra problem, which is that we can buy these and Airmore can't. Airmore can produce these, we can't. None of our priests produce these guys, or the undead version, obviously. And so when it comes to the Lictor, I just, I don't touch it. You really can. They're really great at stopping early rushes. This is par part of what makes them so good at killing Airmore, is you can throw these guys in your battlefield and they have the same combat speed so they don't run off ahead and they do a lot of damage to undead and just a lot of base damage in general really good stat line for these guys for anti-sacreds these guys are terrible ethereal just not good enough to make this gold cost worth it it's way too high it's nice having an early undead but 
you have access to undead chaff spam. So why would you use this when you have that? I mean, you already have this for magic weapons. If you need magic weapons against Ethereal, you'd use these guys, not these. They're just silly. It doesn't, it, I have not found a way to make shadow vessels very good. And I've tried, believe me, I've tried doing meme blesses and it does not work out. You also get four death gems. It says three here, but then you get one here and then you get one astral every turn. Really good death and astral income. The thing about the death gem income that you want to keep in mind is when you're looking at your commanders, right? Let's go through the commanders one by one. We have a good assassin. This guy's solid, well-talented. Throw these around every once in a while, knock some off, use them during hard expansions if you need to, though I prefer these. Centurion, great leadership, good protection, and they have a hat. Solid troop leader. Legatus Legionis, even better. Just a better version. Still no shield, but they're still solid. And you can always give them a shield if for some reason you make one of them a prophet and you're desperate for it. These, this is how I like to win games with Scalaria. This Scalarian cultist. Do you see how cheap this is? 65 gold for a reanimator priest. The thing that makes a Scalarian cultist strong is if you get these guys as a reanimator priest, they can reanimate three plus long dead warriors, eight plus soulless, six plus ghouls. Now, there are a couple tricks there you want to remember. First off, long dead warriors are what I default to most of the time. Soulless are terrible. You just get a lot more of them if you need, I don't know, something to tear down castle walls. Ghouls. There's a good trick you can do with ghouls. If you're fighting somebody over their land and you know you won't be able to hold it long, have your army, if you have, you know, 10 or 12 of these guys in an army, which is not even close to a lot, have 10 or 12 of these cultists for a turn or two, just start reanimating ghouls and it will murder their population. Just absolutely wipe out their population. It's phenomenal. You can pillage with your commanders and then have ghouls wipe out the population and then just run away. Quick way to, you know, scorched earth somebody. But Sclarian cultists are great because primarily this recruitment points of one. You compare that to your thaumaturg you this is two so in a castle where you built it up you can get one of these per turn you can get two of these per turn and essentially what you're producing is about seven undead per turn forever that you recruit these guys so if you get two of these you get seven per turn forever and then the next turn you get you know 14 per turn so now you're up to 21 per turn it starts ramping up insanely quickly now the primary reason i switch from cultists over to thaumaturgs is not because of efficiency it's because of research i like good research efficiency and being able to pump these guys out in a ton of castles is really nice. And if you can build thaumaturgs in your other castles by throwing a lab in there, you no longer have to recruit thaumaturgs in your capital so you can focus on grand thaumaturgs. These guys are your bread and butter. These guys, well, let's real quick, let's go over the sensor. These are your great leaders. These guys are good leaders. Despite the fact, let me show you, despite the fact that they only have 50 leadership and 100 undead leadership, they can put people into line formations. So this is a huge difference. So these guys are your great leaders. They're undead and regular leaders, phenomenal. And these guys have decent items. They again, don't have helmets. So I really recommend protecting them with helmets or putting them in the back or something. Do not do not sleep on the fact that a random archer can knock you unconscious. It's annoying when it happens. Your sensors are solid, great commanders. This is who I use to command pretty much everybody early game. They're only one recruitment point so it's nice whipping one of these guys out, having them go along with your thaumaturgs and your grand thaumaturgs to carry around your armies because they can carry a bunch of these guys and they can also carry your undead, which is going to be ramping up hopefully from turn one on. Now with your thaumaturgs, as I said, they're old. So there's something to consider, you know, doing an unaging bless on these guys. It's something to consider, but there, I'll show you why with Twiceborn, why we would never want to bother with that. It's just kind of the thing about Scalaria that's a trap is that a lot of times you want to invest in your troops. Like you want to get a whole bunch of productivity. You want to get a whole bunch of methodologies for ramping up troop production. But your troops aren't great. Your troops are just good, solid troops. That's what they are. They're not great. They're good. And the problem with them is this right here. This is something your long dead don't deal with at all. So you have the advantage of having great death mages and astral. And you have the advantage of having great troops for rushes. But after your initial expansion, once you start getting that undead production up, why would you ever pay for something when you can get it for free, right? So once you get these Grand Thaumaturgs, they can natively cast Twiceborn, which is two death. And because of that, these guys, I highly, highly, highly recommend twice borning and murdering them immediately. It's one of the best things you can do because this goes away when you twice born them. Let me real quick pull up a twice born white mage split. And as you'll see here, twice borning, your thaumaturge 
gets you a white mage. Great chassis for communion setup, and obviously you'd have to put a uh, death staff on them to be able to get to death two to be able to pull this off, but that's pretty easy for you to produce. And this one only has lower HP because of the affliction he has, but your Grand Thaumaturgs also pull as a white mage. So if you guys are looking at the strength of twice boring all of your mages, it's there. It's definitely there. And it's something that you want to do late game because the more undead mages you have, the better once you twice born them. So it saves you a lot of money. So you get to be rich and free. Something Air er er more was wishing they had. There we go. So you saw that these guys, the Grand Thaumaturgs and the regular Thaumaturgs, both turn into white mages. They obviously keep their magic pads. So don't go, if you're brand new, don't go twice spawning one of these and hoping he turns into the equivalent of one of these. It won't. But remember, Grand Thaumaturgs, major battlefield casters because of these pads. You can get air, water, astral, or death. Astral and death don't open up anything for you. Water and air do. We're going to talk about this in a how to fix your magical diversity section in a little bit, but these guys are your bread and butter for that reason. You need them for sight searching. You need them for communion masters. You need a lot of things from these guys. So we're going to go over that more in the strategy section when we talk about that later. But remember, Grand Thaumaturgs for combat, Thaumaturgs for combat, but mostly research and cultists for producing massive amounts of armies. If you look, your Grand Thaumaturgs here, when they are not profited, they can make two Long Dead Horsemen a turn, seven Long Dead Warriors a turn, 24 Soulless, and eight Ghouls. Now, if you profitize one of them, they don't gain any ability like summoning Lictors, like Ermor does. They only get three Long Dead Horsemen, nine Long Dead Warriors, 32 Soulless, and nine Ghouls. In my opinion, not really worth it. On a side note, it's a little weird. If you take one of your normal troops that aren't you know, reanimator priests, they don't have the actual tag, your prophet won't be able to produce undead. So consider that if you're going to prophetize your original centurion, he cannot animate undead ever unless he started with the ability to. So, you know, if you take a Scalarian cultist and ramp him up to a prophet for some weird reason, that'd be cool. But if you ramp up somebody that doesn't have a reanimator tag, they won't be able to. So keep that in mind. Now, all of your mages, Grand Thaumaturg, Thaumaturg, and Cultist, they all have minus one leadership penalty and no line formations. This is a problem. So make sure along with your massive amounts, because you can sometimes get lost in the sauce and have too many of these guys running around and not remember to bring these guys along to set up your line formations and carry your troops. If you take a look at the Thaumaturg, his reanimation bonus is going to be one long dead horseman per turn, five long dead warriors, 16 soulless, and seven ghouls, which is great. Now the Scalarian cultist, his reanimation bonus is three warriors, three plus warriors, eight plus soulless, six plus ghouls. So if you're looking at these guys and comparing them, you can see why two Scalarian cultists add up really fast versus one Thaumaturg. Because one Thaumaturg is going to pump out maybe a horseman, which is something the cultists can't do, but the warriors, you're pumping out more warriors with the same, with the double the cultists that you would with a Thaumaturgs. So Thaumaturgs are really better for hopping in communions as slaves or like some weird reverse tur turbo communion you're doing. And that's kind of it. They're good at research and being slaves in communions. That's essentially what you want them for. It's really nice because it's always satisfying to my brain to have, this is my master in a communion. This is my slave in a communion. And this is my reanimator priest. Before I move on, I really want to go over your holy spells. You have Unholy Command, Unholy Protection, Unholy Blessing, Unholy Power. Understand that these affect your living troops and these affect your undead troops. So you're essentially never going to cast these except Divine Blessing, right? You're never going to bother because you're going to have hordes of undead. Now, when it comes down to this, you have a really fun level 3 spell, Apostasy. Magic Resace negates easily, but it's a range... 50 one person target will corrupt the faith of an enemy priest or a sacred soldier. This is part of what makes you so good at anti rush. If people are rushing you with sacreds or maybe one sacred commander, you can have level three priests target that commander with your hordes of undead stomping forward. Your hordes of undead are stomping, annoying his sacreds. And sure, they'll cut through your undead, but you can just bink a priest over and over and over until he finally loses this, and boom, you've charmed him. It's a really, really nice spell, specifically because fatigue cost is zero. So you don't need to set up communions for it. You don't need anything like that. You can just stomp on somebody with this. Now, the magic resist negates easily. If anybody has magic resist on their sacred bless, it makes it way more useless because you can treat it like, you know, essentially double strength. But this is something that's useful against low magic resist sacred rushes, which a lot of times people don't think of magic resist on a sacred rush early game. They don't think you're going to be hitting them with powerful spells, whereas you can hit them with this on day one. That's something to consider. Unholy power, we'll briefly go over it, but go watch my Aramore video if you want a full breakdown of how to buff your 
long dead. Attack speed, extra speed, and attack skill. Unholy blessing for an undead bless, which we probably should take. Protection of the Sepulchre, extra magic resist, which you definitely want, and power of the Sepulchre to get the whole battlefield attacking and moving faster. We'll briefly run over a few. Here's your long dead, basic long dead. Again, go watch my Air More video. I'll link it up above right now. Go watch my or more video. It's the same troops. They have a few troops that we don't have, but very few. We still get the basic long deads, the legionnaires, the velites. We get the horsemen. We get a lot of the stuff that you get with Airmore. So I'm not going to go over it again. Go watch that video. Plus, it gives me an extra view. Thank you for that. And on that note, go down and hit the subscribe button and throw me a like if you like what's going on with these videos. That way I know what style to make these videos in. Because if you guys don't like and subscribe anything, then I don't know what you do like, what you don't like. So let me know. Keep in touch. And then we'll move on to our next section now. All right, now let's hop into Pretender Creation. In the past, Pretender Creation has been a little bit more of a specific thing for me, I guess you could say. I like to give people very, very specific examples. So what I'm going to give you is a few of my pre-mades that I have used in multiplayer games this year. Can you tell what I play often? So this is, first of all, we have Divine Emperor. The ability of this nation to get Divine Emperor is almost like a cheat code. This guy is so cheap and so efficient for what he does. Even though Rainbow Chassis were nerfed, I feel like this guy wasn't. He starts at Dominion 2, has one Astral, I believe, and 10 to get any others. I love loading this guy up. So every once in a blue moon, if I'm focusing on what I call the two playstyles, the living versus the dead playstyle for Scalaria, if I want a little safer of a living playstyle. For example, if you're in a long-term game, but everybody's very close together, you know, something with like 10 provinces per nation or, you know, five or eight, or depending on, you know, what mod you use or what builder you use, this is a very good style chassis to go with, or I should say a very good style to go with where you focus on your living mages, right? If we get cold resistance on our grand thaumaturgs and our thaumaturgs, it prevents people from just deleting them with battlefield wide cold spells. If we get, especially with a cold dominion, if we get resilience of the earth protects us from fire and shock spirit sight, so we can see in the darkness and in caves, which is huge since we're going to be powerful in the undead ways later and we're going to be wanting to spam things like darkness this is huge undead command is great it was buffed from dominions 5 to dominion 6 i would say this is a 100 must take to at least 100 undead command otherwise you're gonna to have to waste death gems on mound kings to ferry around your troops and you really don't want to have to do that or have 20 sensors and again since they're missing hats it's really worth your opponent's time to lightning bolt Thunderstrike, launch arrows, whatever, and just delete those guys. So you really want to kind of protect them with shock resist and things like that. Poison resist is really good if you're dropped. Foul vapors is way harder to drop in Dom 6. I would even go so far as to say you are not going to be dropping it unless it's super, super late game and somehow you broke into it. But it's still something good against other people like middle-aged Satis which we're working on a guide soon for. Strong Vitae. The reasoning behind this is that it boosts your mage's HP up so that they're over 10. I believe this gets them to 11, if I'm not mistaken. And the good thing about that is it boosts regen if you put regen on your communions. Plus, it also just gives them a couple extra hit points. You could do Undying, which is a little more efficient, but I prefer having just a flat HP when I'm focusing on my living troops. Now, you can see we went with a little order. We don't care about Dominion because we're going to be pumping out temples. We want order and we want productivity so our income is solid. We took a little bit of cold because I don't like people lighting me on fire with my undead hordes. I took growth. I nerfed my down to misfortune. I personally hate this because anytime I do this, I'm guaranteeing myself I'll get 15 negative events per turn, probably unrest on day one in my capital, but you know, whatever. Magic, very important because your thaumaturgs only have what base nine research. This gets them up to 11. This makes you way more efficient. Now, I don't focus on this. This is the first thing I'll drop if I need to drop anything because even though your thaumaturgs are super efficient if you raise magic up here, this does lower the magic resist of your undead horde which you can counteract with your national unholy spells, but it's something that you can afford to drop simply because of the fact that you can easily produce tons of skull mentors. So that's something that I keep in mind whenever I'm doing this. This nation is all about efficiency, and if you're spending every turn pumping out mages to capitalize on this, you're not spending every turn cap punching out cultists to capitalize on that, right? So this particular strategy I like pumping out a ton of living mages, and the reason I say it's kind of a, like, everybody's close together, but long-term, is this is obviously a long-term build. Your, your 
Pretender is imprisoned. So you're not going to get access to Troll Kings and you're not going to get access to any of the late game stuff until he shows up. That's what makes it dangerous for blitzes and similar things. But if you're close together and fighting all the time, this protects your mages before they can twice born themselves. You can't always afford a twice born every mage. As much as the theoretical is nice to twice born all your mages and run around with unlimited undead mages, it's really expensive to do that. So if you have a bad luck game where you're not getting a lot of death gem income, this protects your mages regardless, and this also protects your white mages when they get there. Even though you don't need, you know, poison and cold resistance on the white mages, that's why we went a little less. Another thing is having cold resistance on your troops when you have cold lands is good because it can help negate the movement penalty. Now it won't help your knights or any of your troops, but if you have just a whole bunch of undead, then you'll be fine, you'll be walking around full speed. So this is one consideration that I have when I'm doing that strange tight quarters where you're fighting all game because you need this stuff early, but long term where I'm going imprisoned and I'm getting extra scales and extra diversity. This diversity is bonkers for finding sites, which is this guy's primary purpose, finding sites and casting troll king spells to get us massive earth magic. Another thing that you like to, I like to consider, early blitzes. If I'm doing anything where the game is early and people are sacred rushing and everyone's fighting, I like to do fire resist, shock resist. I feel like these are mandatory to protect your mages because even as a white mage they have 21 hp but zero protection so you start getting to the point where any nation remember this write this down darn it any nation that has a massive dependence on their communions and yes that's scalaria in a nutshell requires their mages to not be killed by battlefield wide spells you cannot make yourself vulnerable to battlefield wide spells if you're going to run communions because if you carefully plan out your communion and then the enemy all they have to do is spend three fire gems and annihilate your troops it's over you lose. So I always take fire and shock resist, no matter how much you have to overpay for them in Dom 6. I took arcane finesse here because I like being able to penetrate. Since we have access to high level astral and high level death, I really, really like this when I can afford it to penetrate enemy magic resistance. This is really good. Plus, side note, when you're buffing your undead troops, protection of the sepulcher, it's negated by magic resistance. So your undead will not gain plus four MR if they make the resistance. This actually helps you penetrate your own undead's resistance to cause them to get more magic resistance so it's kind of counterintuitive but it does help and then here i just went tons of undead command because if i'm in a blitz i'm going to be swarming people with cultists and tons and tons of long dead i made sure i have enough for sight searching but unfortunately i don't have enough for troll kings unless i empower myself and obviously this goofball can put on earth boots and he can put on crystal coin and he can put on all sorts of stuff so he enables us to forge and sight search very very good setup for that so that's good for an early game battle non-stop battle but the thing that we're focusing on here remember is remember i told you a living or a dead focus this is a hyper specialized focus on death you are not going to be sending tons and tons of your grand thaumaturgs into combat unless you've twice born them because if you twice born them and they turn into white mages along with fire resist and shock resist remember they get cold and poison resist so they're basically protected against all the major elements that's the primary reasoning behind specifically avoiding the poison resist and everything else you could also pop a point off of undead command or one off of you know shock resist and and give yourself something else but two shock resist is really nice because it prevents you from getting stunned for the most part fire resist prevents you from getting annihilated by most of those spells and then if you're able to twice born even if your mage gets killed in a before he dies from twice born at the very least if he's twice born he'll come back with that poison and cold resist and here's i named this guy medium late game i always change the game in multiplayer the name in multiplayer but i name them for reminding me what they're for this guy can cast troll kings this the very like natively this is a very nice setup for this and he has solid astral to dive deep into astral if you're at four you can usually get up to seven i got fire resist i got shock resist i have arcane finesse i have undead command you saw all of this but what i did was i switched from dormant to imprisoned if you look at our last one it was only dormant and we still had all the stuff see we have a five dominion because blitzes your dominion is going to be pushing against people with two cold right when i switch over here this is for longer games so i went imprisoned i went with the same fire resist shock resist arcane finesse and the dead command i threw in extra poison resist just because i had the points for it the dom is five but i took away the cold because that's that cold is going to hurt you in longer games if you like in dom six if you have swinging temperature scales it hurts it feels like it hurts a lot more than dom 5 did and so you know i went for like more growth lower misfortune no cold similar things so this is a longer style game the biggest thing about producing your commander this is exactly how i would do it for scalaria is if i produce my commander here's what i do first of all always click this guy 
Don't ever, don't, you try to find me someone who's better. There's something you can do for specialization, you know, something really specific, but it's very hard to beat this guy. Look at that, 90 points, and he comes with 10 for a new cost, Grand Communicant, and he's got triple the HP of a normal human because of the way that mounts work now. Stupid freak. But we always pick this guy, right? Yet, I never go below this if I can help it because I don't want him getting massively murdered with astral spells. But beyond that, you have a lot of flexibility. This is what I've found is the best combination of skill of dominion points to make sure that I can recruit enough year one to be able to get my expansion really steamrolling. But beyond this, the money, you have to look at it like middle-aged Aramor. The money is just gravy. It's extra gravy. If you were a completely dependent nation on gold, like a normal nation that has to recruit all of their troops and all their commanders and leave them sucking up salary every year, then you know you'd have to emphasize this a little more. Maybe go a little higher, crank out some more growth, that kind of thing. But the beautiful thing is they've nerfed growth in Dom 6. You don't care about that nearly as much as anybody else. You don't need a super high dominion score. I've gone as low as three because you're going to be building 10 plus temples. So you really can be flexible with this. You can go, hey, I really want tons of research or hey, I want my undead hordes to be more resistant to enemy magic. And then I produce a ton of skull mentors. You just have to remember there's a cost. If you go like this and you don't produce skull mentors, you're going to lose the game. You're going to lose the research game and you're going to lose the game because of it. Scalaria is great at beating people in the research game. So I would say minimum this, maximum this. Luck, since you already went order, I'd be comfortable going down every single time. This would be a good starting baseline for me. Leave this neutral, leave this neutral, and change these based on the length of the game. Very short game? Sure, crank out death. Very long game? Sure, crank out some growth. Very short game? Don't worry about the income hit you're going to take. You know, I wouldn't go hot because they'll melt your undead troops, but short game? No problem. Maybe there, so you still get a positive income, but you know, you're in a long-term game? Leave it neutral so that it can stay neutral and you keep your money up. And then what you do is you basically look at your spells. I have the debug mod on right now, so you'll see. But if you look at your conjuration, the stuff you really want is Troll King's Court. This cranks out a Troll King, which gives you earth magic. If you want to go with higher level water, you can go with Sea King's Court, crank out a whole bunch of Sea Kings for the Turbo Communion that I'll talk about in the magic section. If for some reason you want to focus on nature, get some Lamias, throw them in the Turbo Communion setups by having them guard commanders and then casting Death Vortex. Lamia Queen, she's solid. And of course our classic White's Bane. Another good undead spell early game that you can think about really early is Raise Skeletons in combat. This helps your undead in battle early, early game a lot but the primary thing you want to look at is reanimation this thing's three death gems but it produces 10 plus skeletons at a on a short notice it's very nice you may not it may not be efficient being able to pump these out is almost impossible because of the fire requirement but being able to pump out anything i love behemoths for undead these throw one or two of these in there the advantage of elephants is trampling right but the disadvantage is their morale these are undead elephants. They run around and they have 50 morale, so they do not care. As long as you keep your commander up, they will not trample your own troops. But you can pump out so much undead and do things like rigor mortis to exhaust living troops. And if you have an entirely undead army, you're good to go. And then if somebody comes with a ton of priests, you know what you do? You hit them up with a living army and you annihilate them by throwing some trier ariuses in there and smashing them to the ground in a big battle where you just focus on emphasizing down their big commanders and their sacreds and whatever they have with those one-use gladiators. Pretty nice. A bit expensive in my opinion. Soul Vortex, beautiful. When you get your undead drop in this as communion masters and they're surrounded by something like Lamias or Sea Trolls with regeneration thrown on them, similar things. It's really, really nice. You can get a serious, serious communion burst going on with this nation. But the beautiful thing is when you're designing this guy, pick your play style and pick your opponents. Let's say we're playing against M.A. Satis and somebody else you know is going to drop foul vapors on you. There you go. And you get poison resist maybe twice. Or if you really enjoy the idea of going into blood magic, which is doable here, get strong blood. Poison resist and disease resist. Makes it really good for your Grand Thaumaturg so you don't have to worry so much about twice borning them. If you know, for example, if you know, for example, that your play style is to actually use your gems like you should be doing in a multiplayer game, you can always assume that you're not going to be twice borning in one and go with a living strategy where you try to keep your people alive, throw a little growth in there, make sure your dudes come in a little less old and start cranking out, you know, maybe this. So you can pump out magic items that are a little better to help out living troops. There's a lot of flexibility here. And the beautiful thing about Scalaria is that's what makes them strong. Unlike Aramor, who needs to do at least this to be able to crank out their early summons to get their mages on the field in year one, you can go year three and then you can go massive spells. You could even do something like this. And now essentially you have an answer to everybody because you can just summon your way out of things by breaking into magical diversity. 
remember, this goofball, even though you wouldn't want to throw him into combat, in my opinion, this guy could step into a really important battle and annihilate people by jumping in as a communion master. Really, really, really powerful, really effective, opens up a lot of bless options for you. But the thing I want you to remember is that when you start, start off with this base right here. This is an easy base, actually, like that. That's a cheap base with this guy. So if we drop this all the way down, you're looking at this. You want at least four astral so you don't get annihilated by somebody just plinking at your mages. This is a really good base right here. You have 225 bonus points. If you're in a super early game, go ahead and emphasize your stuff. Go maybe a little death, get yourself some diversity opening up like that. Get yourself some of that, pump out maybe two more Dominion points, and then maybe you want some fire access and you want some glamour access for some reason. Do this, crank this out, say, hey, we know we need some undead command. Let's get at least two of those, but it's early game, so we want to focus. Let's try to get ourselves, early game means we're going to be doing a lot of troop fighting. Let's get ourselves just some reinvigoration so our communions run a little more smoothly. Give ourselves some undying so our commanders that are still going to be alive don't get just annihilated. And then throw in an extra undead command. You could do something like this. This would be a very basic bless, and you would be depending on your guy to come out awake, start cranking out the research, and then doing things like that to get you into the fight sooner and stronger with tons of undead and tons of communion strength with no setup required. Now, if you wanted to be a little more tactical, maybe you go, okay, we wanna be dormant. Let's take away some of the undying. Let's add a little fire. Let's add a little shock resist. And instead of glamor, let's go with a generic bless for our mages. Fire resist, shock resist, give ourselves some cold resist, give ourselves a little poison resist and pick up say, a third point of fire. There you go. Now you're sitting with an extra design point. You could put that back into neutral and because you're going a little later of a strategy. And now all of your mages come out protected from getting one shot by everything. Drop reinvigoration, throw in some extra resilient HP, and you're doing better. You can even drop a resilient HP to get some low light vision so your guys don't get upset in the darkness if you haven't had a chance to twice born them. There's a lot of options you have here. It's really, really flexible. Let me know down in the comments what you guys have come up with for Pretender Creation. I absolutely love how flexible Scalaria is with Pretender Creation, and there are some absolute meme builds you can go with that are just disgusting and fun. But that should set you guys on the right path. Make sure you cover the undead command when you're doing it. We got buffed in Dominion 6 where undead command is now plus 50 per point instead of plus 20. We need to take advantage of that and we really need to start slamming people with undead hordes with actual mages backing them up, unlike Airmore. Let me know what you guys come up with. All right, boys, I'm briefly going to talk about research. Yes, we're covering research here, but I also want you guys to go watch my Air More video. That helps me out, and it also makes it easier for you as we basically have the same access to spells. Air More has a lot more fire and other variations, but the death and astral setup remains the same for them. So let's go through and see what we want to rush early. First of all, Thaumaturgy, level one. You definitely want level one Thaumaturgy for Communion Master and Communion Slave. This is a core, core, core part of Air More. If you're curious, here's a link to my Communion video. But we also have later things like Mind Burn. We have the ability to paralyze. We have Soul Slay. This is super important for thugs and super combatants coming through. Very, very important. Enslaved Mind is nice. Although we do have apostasy in our spells. So we really like emphasizing this is eh, it makes it so magic resist isn't as effective. But apostasy is just much easier to access. And we have so many more priests than we do super mages. So something to consider. Conjuration. Remember, with our grand thaumaturgs with air randoms, we can still produce air elementals which is still just as strong. Not necessarily as strong as Dom 5 was, but it's still pretty darn strong. It's pretty far up there. And it offers you trampling flying creature that you may not otherwise have access to. It can throw some people off and surprise them a little bit. Power of the Spheres is amazing for communions. Makes the caster more powerful in elemental and sorcery paths. So plus one to everything but blood and holy. And the good thing about that is holy, you don't really need a plus one in because when you communion up holy, most holy spells are zero fatigue anyway. And when you give plus one to all of your slaves, it makes them a lot better resisting that fatigue when you're dropping spells on people in a communion. Something really important to look at. Now, like I said, I'm going to be super quick with this research because most of it's in Air More. Consider going into alteration specifically to get anything that you would get normally. For example, body ethereal, very good buff, even though it's very, very small. Very, very, very good buff early. Skeletal body helps against early archery, although annoyingly enough, this doesn't affect spirit form anymore. So late game, obviously, you want to hope to break into other paths so you can utilize things like 
group stone skin, you know, lightning resistant warriors, massive maws of the earth. But this is a little later on. This is when you break into different pathways. When you're looking at evocation, you want to pay special attention to star fires, which is great when you're trying to hit people early with a little bit of evocation damage to back up your little undead hordes that you've already started to produce. Later on, when you get down to shadow bolt, it's a decent bolt to throw that doesn't affect your undead troops. Nether bolts are great. They feeble mind people. Make sure you're not throwing this out when you have, you know, a thug or something up front that you don't want feeble minded, but it does a lot of damage and it causes a lot of problems for people that have very, very specific, we'll call them finesse builds coming at you. Stellar cascades is all always good because it's a fatigue check which is absolutely decimating against anybody fighting undead because that's already their enemy to begin with and if you look magic resist is a check only for half damage they still take 12 so it's very nice shadow blast is great for a gem it's a little expensive because you're throwing a gem i believe into it yeah throwing a death gem into it but it has 35 plus range 9 plus aoe and it does 8 plus armor negating magic resist for half damage and doesn't affect your troops at all so you're paralyzing and smashing a bunch of sacred troops with this this is a good little emergency pull out of the card spell. Construction, we already know what's going on here. Enchantment is huge for you. This is one of the schools that I rush up the soonest because you can get animate skeleton early which can turn tides in small early fights you could revive kings but i go out of my way to specifically avoid reviving these guys just because it saves me death gem income very useful if you're fighting in battles where you know it's going to be darkness and you need accuracy for some reason raise skeletons is a solid spell early game at least obviously when you get to level four you get twice born which is huge death gems 10 for medium but again it goes up by three death gems per size so we're lucky we're medium so it's 10 per mage but behemoth i love using these on dead elephants huge 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 point of success for me here when i get those trample does so much for your armies it's not even funny when you get down to five you get the obvious horde of skeleton spam combined with your massive communions and super communions this is going to be absolutely bonkers in the mid game when you get up to rigor mortis at enchantment six makes your undead win that battle of attrition a lot better this is why we don't focus so much on foul vapors as in dom five much more difficult for us to get we've already looked through thaumaturgy but i do like to point out the notable terror terror is a phenomenal spell to spam on people when your undead hordes are fighting them because it will affect your friendly troops but when you're loaded with undead they don't care and you will be spamming living soldiers and making them run away this is a very 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 powerful to spam with communion because that fear just keeps stacking up until they just all run away it's very strong point to hit problem with thaumaturgy is primarily you don't get a lot early game going up this so communion master and slave that's a necessity i almost do that first every game but and frighten helps a little bit but frighten is different than fear so they have to get frightened and then take damage to get fear checks whereas terror actually causes the check when it hits them so i really really like having that option i love getting up to at least thom four first of all because then you can do gnome lore aspects all the little gem site searching places even though i don't trust those i don't generally waste gems on those because i have too many uses for those gems but if you don't have a lot of uses for gems let's say you only have like a level two pretender that can cast spells like auspex and augury and you want to waste it and in, in the hopes like for example with throne provinces i love casting these spells on throne provinces because you're almost guaranteed to get something out of it but i really prefer using them but soul slay this is amazing when you're fighting thugs and similar combatants control the dead's always a good spell snags you a couple little undead pretty easily when you're fighting someone like airmore leeching darkness is great because you're undead you don't care wither bones is phenomenal when you go against undead but remember what we talked about in airmore video the magic resist check for half damage really nerfs this wither bone spell a lot so it's actually not as good against airmore as you might think blood magic we don't really focus on we have nothing unique here there's nothing really special you really have to go out of your way to get into this with your pretender and then you would have absolutely no synergy with your nation whatsoever so I I, I would honestly just stay away from blood if possible. Blood magic has some good items you could produce, but that's just not the best. Now your divine spells, obviously you want to be getting unholy blessing on your entire battlefield. If you can avoid having living troops in the battlefield, like living commanders, that's great. Twice born them and turn them undead, but then you'll have to cast divine blessing and unholy blessing. Protection of the sepulcher, just like there more. A great buff this is where arcane finesse comes in handy it helps negate your own undeads magic resist and then if you have magic plus two it drops it again so it makes it really easy to give them plus four unholy power and apostasy this is a great spell 
it just doesn't kick in very often if you have, you know, 11 plus morale. You barely ever affect them with anything. Now, let's take a look at these magical trinkets. Basic weapons, nothing really of note. Helmets. These are very easy for you to produce, and they help your commanders a lot because your commanders are often without hats, your lictors, your sensors. Um, this is not something that's easy for you to produce, but if you can get to this, is obviously superior. One thing to consider early game when you're producing troops is if you get up to construction three, you can produce owl quills, which helps benefit your research. And since you have so many mages with low research, this actually benefits quite a bit. I would rather use air gems for more impactful things since you're not going to have a great air gem economy, but it's something to consider if you want to add to it. Here's greater magic items where you'll see a lot more success if you build any thugs you have access to frost brand the thistle mace if you could actually get your pretender to produce one of these you can freely switch this over to any lizard shamans that you find in the world and it will enable them to produce more of these so it kind of gets a snowball effect skull staff an obvious favorite to get our death a little higher though i would say it's less necessary on this nation than most winged helmet is difficult for you to get up to I wouldn't focus on it very much unless your pretender specifically can produce it. Same with flame helmet. You're just not strong enough in those directions. Horror helmets are great if you want to create a thug or somebody to run around with your undead hordes. Put somebody in there with a horror helmet and all of a sudden you're making fear checks against the undead or against the living while you're hiding behind a line of undead. That's very effective. If you want to dive into the water, Robe of the Sea is good, but there's a cheaper version that gets you in the water called Shambler Skin Armor that'll get you in the water with your commanders so you don't have to worry so much about getting in there. Don't go in there if they have a water nation a water nation will stomp all over you and end your life pretty quickly and here's the real reason you want your pretender to have earth and astral on them is because sky metal matrix makes you a commander in a communion you can throw this on a non-astral commander a random that you find and this is phenomenal but not nearly as important as the slave matrix if you cast troll king's court or see troll king's court you will end up with slaves in that communion that have tons of regen and you can make a really powerful turbo communion because if you have let's say you have a lizard shaman who enters the communion as a master and then cast personal regen well now your 10 percent regen troll kings get another 10 percent regen and now they're at 20 percent. if you're in the water they go up to 30 percent, but don't focus too much on that but you've got that you could surround your communion slave with a bunch of actual trolls on guard commander and then have have your master cast soul vortex and suddenly your slaves are soul vortexing trolls around themselves that are all regenerating and sucking up their hp to regenerate their stamina so you can go for ever with this setup this is a very powerful item to get access to and i highly highly recommend abusing this to open up your ability in communions to sustain communions for a long, long, long time as it will help a ton. Most of the time, in fact, if you do this, the thing that will annoy you the most is the fact that you will always outlive your scripts with your communions and you'll hit that sixth level spell where you start acting like dumbasses and casting the wrong spells left and right. So look forward to that. Skull Mentor, something very, very powerful for us because we love adding extra research. And the primary reason for extra research, we have good access to cheap-ish mages that have decent research, kind of low on the thaumaturgs for the cost. But the good thing is we're so flexible because any mage, when you're walk, if you play multiplayer, so if you play single player, you might put mages in a province and just have them sit there forever and kind of get used to that. But in multiplayer, that'll get you killed because then you don't have any mages in battle. So what you'll learn in multiplayer is that it's a lot better to have a bunch of these items because you could have an army passing through a castle but you need to wait one turn to pick up you know an item that you're producing or a bunch of army from there for the next turn like say you see a big army coming your way so you want to recruit a bunch of retariuses you can have these skull mentors pop them on each one of your commanders in that army have them research for one turn essentially more than doubling their research for that turn and then take these back off and throw them back in the lab and then run off to the battle it's very helpful it makes you a lot more flexible in what you're doing to be efficient with your mage turns and i mean if you get super late you can get a water bracelet to buff your water randoms a little higher but you really don't need to focus on this too much because this is a really high point to climb in construction that you don't want to be wasting your time on when you're going through and choosing your research i recommend thaumaturgy one and then conjuration three if you're going to fight soon or enchantment five if you're not get yourself up there to that horde of skeletons and your life gets much easier with this as soon as you get there throw in some evocation if you need it a little bit of alteration couldn't hurt but it won't help a lot early game until you break into other pathways as there are just better earth and air in this path than anything else so let me know how that goes let me know if you guys have a different research order than thaumaturgy into enchantment or thaumaturgy into conjuration because i really like getting you know one thaum 
three conj and then hopping into enchantment to get higher or three enchantment hopping into conj it really conjuration and enchantment seems to be the big schools for this nation at least the way that i play i really like getting that twice born to reduce my costs every turn and i really like getting conjuration to get my pretender up this conjuration how soon i go into conjuration almost always depends on when my pretender wakes up if he wakes up at year one sure i'll jump into conjuration kind of early because it can break me into paths and breaking out of your magical diversity trap is one of the most important things for scalaria but let me know if you guys have any more specific specific research orders you like to go in. All right, boys, gonna do a brief run through of expansion. Now, I'm gonna do something a little different here. So ordinarily, I crank through a single player style expansion where we try to just grab as many provinces as humanly possible. What I'm gonna do instead this time is I'm gonna try to give you guys a more multiplayer focused expansion. So something where we're evaluating each turn, looking at provinces, making a plan. This is a random map I just generated, so I have no idea what's in it, but we do look and we say, hmm, we like income, right? That means we like farmland. We like more farmland, and I don't see any rivers nearby, but we really would like some farmland so up is a way we want to go but we also have to expect knights to be up here or crusader or sorry cavalry heavy calves something like that and in between we're looking at plains which could be a barbarian location waste plains so we have a lot of opportunity for a lot of barbarians to be showing up here so what i like to do is again we don't want our profit just summoning undead so instead, we'll profitize this guy because then he has leadership and undead leadership. And we'll send his scout. We'll send him here. Put him on a retreat. Put him way back here. Have him walk in so I can actually see what's there. Take a look at our commanders. All of our guys have javelins, which is good. Seven protection. These guys have 14 protection. The legionnaires. This is all good. 10 combat speed, eight combat speed. So that'll get weird. So what we like to do, put them up here. Put them in line formation. Fire. Put these guys in front. Put them in sparse line. Put them in fire. And we'll see what happens if we put our commander right behind. And we'll set his orders next turn when we're done set our research before we forget the thom and then we're going to go right up enchantment just because we know this time we're just going to aim for a dead focused summons and try to get up to those twice borns and everything to cut down on our costs if you're starting off in the game easy thing to start with is velites because they're 10 10 crank out as many of these as you can get yourself i like to get my research started with a thaumaturge but one option you could do is a double sclerian cultist on turn one that's a really good option to go with on turn one because we already have a prophet who's going to be able to command and all of our living troops and our undead troops. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on two Sclarian cultists, start getting ourselves undead, and then we can pump out the sensors. Now you might also instead go with a Thaumaturg, and I'll show you exactly why. Let me, instead of this, which is a specialized start, go with a generalized start. And then next turn, what we'll do is we'll crank out a cultist and a sensor. The advantage to both of these being one turn, one point, is that we get one, two points here, and then one, two points here. So this is just two turns of recruitment. Pump out a couple more of these Velites, and then just in the background, let's get four of these Retarius. They don't cost much in upkeep, so we'll have them just in case we happen to have some knights nearby. Let's check out what this turns out like for us. All right, we've got turn two starting. Battle in Valkoria. Let's go check out what our scout found. What do we face in here? Is this an easy one? Horse Tribe Cavalry. So eight protection, 16 defense. That's really high for our starting troops. Fortunately, when we chuck javelins, this is the only thing that'll matter. Problem is their short bows will tear into us pretty heavily. That does quite a bit of damage. And it looks like they have 26 of them, which is pretty hefty to deal with for a turn one expansion. This, however, is a good plan. Wow, we have barbs, archers, heavy infantry, militias, light infantry, heavy militias, light cav, militias, and heavy cav, horse tribe cav. Go take a look at what these goofballs are doing over here. But what we wanna do, there's our velites, combat speed of 10, so we want them to be with the other combat speed 10 guys. We have these on sparse, these on regular line, so hopefully they kind of sneak through after chucking their javelins and get in there, get in the fight. We'll have these guys on divine blessing just for himself, and then a bunch of words of stone, advance and cast spells, and then he'll drop word of stone on enough of those cavalry guys that it'll hopefully it'll hit them and not their horse and then the horse will just flee which gives us a lot of hp routing going on and that's what we're going to hope for in our combat here so let's send them off to fight hop in here to grab a little more we didn't get all the research we wanted we thought we were going to be able to crank these out i don't know what happened it took away our ability to summon those but we'll be able to fix that now with a bunch more velites get a couple more of these i like having a big reservation of these just in case i get rushed remember it's too late if you see the sacred rush sprinting in on your right hand side and you only have two or three turns to get enough of these guys up it's too late at that point but i like grabbing these if you're facing anything really strong like heavy cav grabbing a couple shadow vessels is good because of the ethereal buff it's very difficult for them to just one shot these ladies but i i really prefer the retiarius is much easier from my perspective so let's check out what happens all right let's go check out i think this is our scout yes what do we got here oh boy good thing we checked this place out we've got light cavalry 
with short bows, high defense skill. We've got heavy cavalry with very high protection, Morningstar and Lance, and obviously the hoof. We've got three mounted commanders, it looks like, and a priest. My goodness, this is a province we're not going to touch for a while. And vine men, why not? Throw, throw some vine men in there. Why not? Of course, of course you have an item, handful of acorns. Of course you do. Uh, Balcoria, that's our expansion. We're expecting a little bit of attrition here because we just have human troops, so we're probably going to get some attrition. Oh, good. They're in sort of a double line. So hopefully when we get there, we'll be able to hit them with those javelins. Get a little more courage going on here. Let's speed up a little bit. Let's see what this original javelin volley looks like for us. See how effective it looks. There we go, getting a few hits. A few more hits. Okay. Our prophet is too far away to be doing Word of Stone, so he's just spamming Sermon of Courage. That's why I put him on advance and cast. There we go. We got some nice javelin hits there. Oh, yeah. Taking out some riders. See these riderless horses. See, now we've got this horse running with his 20 HP routing along with his rider. That's always beneficial. And this guy lost his horse. This guy lost his horse. This horse is just standing here as we meet up with him. And now we've advanced to cast Word of Stone. I like it. Let's see how fast this clears through. We're probably going to lose like uh, eight or nine Guys, it looks like we've taken a little bit of attrition, but that's expected with Velites. Do they still become Pierce Resistant Slight? Yeah, when they get Word of Stone, they become resistant. There we go, get him. What do we lose? Nine. Okay, that's about what we expected. Not bad for a horse tribe cavalry. Now let's see if this paid off. Heavy infantry's militias archers, militias heavy infantry's light infantry's. 60, 80. Mostly heavy infantry's, no archery. Okay, that's actually something we could consider a win. We might be able to take that on. That's a risk though. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to surround ourselves while we build up our army here like so. Actually, let's do this. Have you start reanimating long dead? Have you research? Get that thaumaturgy pumped out. Let's get our research or our troop produ production happening. Let's get some cultists. This is most definitely what I would do. Let's get some more velites. Get a few more retiariuses. This looks doable for these guys because of their javelins. So let's make sure we run over here while we bring this over here. And then let's get a look. Heavy infantries versus mostly militias. Let's check out the militia province and see what happens. Jack this up to six because we like that number. 6 and then 11 when we're rich. We're also looking at putting a fort here and a fort here. So we want to get that stuff started as soon as possible. You can see our income's already ramping up quite heavily. Even though this one is a terrible province. We're going to start getting a lot more income because of our minion in rather short order. So let's go here. Hit Y. The letter Y is in yes. Be able to move your commanders where they go. This guy has no helmet. So just remember that. Put him on hold and stay behind. Put his troops forward line formation to sit here and then fire so that they kind of filter into where we want them and now we should have a pretty good end all right let's check out our next turn this is turn three four research and thaumaturgy finished great so we're already started on enchantment and now even though we don't have the mages for it we have access to communion slaves and masters let's start getting on that enchantment level so we're ready for a battle if we need to get into it cern i think this was our yeah this is our scout let's go check out what they have excellent we're gonna be able to mop these guys up relatively quickly lots of commanders a random heavy infantry there the rest of the heavy infantry here 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. Whole bunch of militia, which are basically non-existent to our javelin volley. And then some light infantry. Okay, so a decent number of troops. Talking 82, yeah, just about right. But that's not going to be too rough for us to get through. These guys will be tough to get through because normally they can get up to 16 protection. But we have 14 protection here and just a little higher defense. So we'll be good with our javelins hitting these guys. Taking them out for the most part. Carry on. Let's go check out what happened with our guys here. Yeah, we'll be able to annihilate these guys. No reason to take our time. Yep. Tearing them apart with the javelin volley, surrounding them and just beating them to death. Yep. And the archer should flee pretty quickly. That's annoying. I swear, some troop targeting protocols do not help. What did we get here? Yeah, loss of three. We're comfortable with that loss. What did we get? We get lucky? Extraordinary agility. No, but that's okay. Let's take these velites, throw them in our velite line here. Now we've got a stronger Velite line. Now we know that we want to take this province out. So I think this is a good risk to take. Send him back to get another army because right now we should have a little bit of undead buildup. Yep, get these guys on more long dead. Remember not to do ghouls because it'll hurt you. But you're seeing our treasury already starting to ramp up relatively quickly. So we can start producing forts with temples rather fast. So let's get some more Velites in here. Let's get another pair of cultists because we want to expand really aggressively. 
get some Retoriuses going on. Put the defense up to six, and let's see what happens. Whoops, forgot. Let's send our scout over here to see what's in here. These guys are gonna be annoying. If we go here with our scout, he'll get killed. Let's go check out over here instead. All right, here we go. Checking out our research and enchantment finished. Not bad at all. Enchantment two's next. Now that we've got an enchantment one, any of our mages that hop into battle can bust out a skeleton or crank out some soulless. Let's go see what happened in CERN. Oh, this is our battle for the province. This is We're gonna take some attrition on this one for sure because there's a lot of numbers here. But let's see what the uh, volley looks like. Let's see how it looks. Against these militia, it's going to be good. But I was hoping that they would volley the heavy infantry, but we should know with a combat speed of 9 versus 10, they're going to be behind. This guy's toast. You isolated yourself. Teamwork, homie. There we go. We haven't filled in our lines yet, so we're going to suffer. There we go. Now the lines are filled in. Now we're going to start whomping them back. And I like it. The heavy infantry are trapped behind their own militia. So we're going to suffer attrition, but not as much as if these guys were up front with their, what is it, broadswords? Yeah. There we go. Take out these heavy infantries by surrounding them. Yep, so we took some attrition there. Probably 10 or 20. Yeah, 13. Not as much as we'd like, but the fact that we now have this province is good. Promised land, this is our scout, right? Uh, heavy infantry. Ooh, even better than we thought. Oh yeah, no tricks, short sword guys, spear, broadswords, 16, 12, 7, 11. Yep, we're sitting pretty with these guys. This is good, 44. Yep, okay, that's our next goal. So now, this is where we get one of these going on. Now if you look, we're already starting to spam our undead. Here's our good old undead boy down here. Put them way up front with sparse line. Actually, we'll just put them in line formation. Makes it easier. Put them a line behind. Do we want these? Hmm. So my strategy with re Red Key Arius is, is to save these for multiplayer fights if I get rushed. But when you see things like Heavy Cav and Light Cav, you really want to run at these with these guys because they will thump them. Or Barbarians even. Could be something like that. That being said, we're going to be more efficient and we're just going to have these guys run at these guys to get the easy province right now. Oops, not you, sir. Sorry, wrong gentleman. You get over there to expand a little faster. And then we're going to look for a little weaker troops around here. We can hit Dovin, circle around to Nern. This one has mostly wolf tribe and this one has militias heavy and light. So we have enough troops here that we can trust in ourselves to be a little stronger. I'll even move them up a little bit. Get that word of stone off a little sooner. Range is pretty short. So we'll get this guy up here, take him out. He has a hat, so he should be okay against wolf tribes. And we'll see if we can move these guys. Nope, that's as close as we can get. And we'll take these guys out, get ourselves another province. And then once our cultist gets up there, he'll be able to produce a castle and then a temple. Get our forts going on. This is turn five. So we want to be able to get those forts going pretty rapidly. I know it might seem early, especially in Dom 6 where they slowed everybody down. But I want to get my forts up and running as fast as possible because that's where Scalaria dominates. Grab ourselves another Thaumaturg, get some more research. And then our pretty classic Retiariuses and Velites as much as we can get. That's what we really want. Now, if something had shown up here, if I saw a Sacred Rush over here or over here, here or something you can easily one two three and then boop 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 right you can easily do that and just crank out a whole bunch more i prefer not doing that just because of the fleeting nature of the ready Ariuses until i need to so i like doing this maximum velites and then ending with these guys because if something weird happens and i don't get my full recruitment i'd rather miss these guys than these guys until i see a threat so let's check it out see what happens all right turn six battle in Dovin. ah uh, this is our prophet correct yeah okay so we scooted him forward a little bit bunch of wolf tribes with the double daggers these guys can cause some decent attrition just because of their first round of combat but i'm hoping with their low morale and our javelins we're going to be able to route them pretty quickly and these guys can be annoying if they hit our profit let's see what happens here yep the annoying volley here we go ja yeah oh yeah we're gonna take plenty of them out yep we're gonna mop them up relatively quickly what the really come on man be a friend stop sending trees at me i don't like having to kill bushes yeah this will be a pretty quick mop up Yep, there's some attrition from the ranged and from the ensnaring. But we mopped them up pretty good. We lost seven. That's more than we'd like to lose, but not unexpected. Now, Kanis Plain, this is our new gentleman, our sensor, running around with these troops. Oh yeah, we'll be fine here. The undead takes the major hit and then splits them, which is really nice. So the undead's going to get chopped up a little bit, but we're just going to swarm them and kill them. Yeah. 
What do we lose? Seven undead and two Velites. I'm okay with that trade. Don't forget, put your defense up. Target your next weak province. What do we want here? Make sure we didn't lose too much. Good. Archers, militia, heavy infantry. Excellent. We can do that. We could also do barbs and meet them with somebody else. Let's grab ourselves another sensor and another cultist. Get ourselves as many Velites as we need. Bunch of these goofballs. Might consider taking that province out. It'll probably, yeah, 12,000 populations. But 13,000 populations actually a much better income than that one. So here, we're going to start on our palisades. Get them produced. We don't see an enemy nearby so we're not too concerned about getting jumped here's another place to build a fort but we might even put a fort here depending on what our incomes are when you go around your cap circle i don't like surrounding my cap circle with forts but i will do it in a tight game i will surround my cap circle with forts like airmore even though it kills the resources in my primary capital i don't care because i'll be able to produce undead which is what i'm after primarily i'm after undead just undead swarms now if you wish you can hurry over here and start pumping out more undead by sending another one of these guys. I like being more efficient and keeping the undead here early game just because I don't like getting rushed and not having something to defend against it. So let's pick our battles here. Militias, heavy infantry is light. Heavy, light militias. Jaguar tribe. Militias, knights, and longbowmen. That's not fun. That's not a fun combo. The longbowmen plus the knights means even our Rediariuses aren't very good because they'll get lit up by the archers. Militias, heavy, and light, but 120 of them? No thanks. I think our easiest target is going to be here or here. And this will bring us a path back and open us up quite a few provinces that will enable us to jack up our income repeatedly by spreading around a little bit so let's make sure we still have enough yep we do let's go over here first take out these heavy guys and then move our way over here on our way back now if these guys have more than 50 next turn we might not be able to do it we might be screwing ourselves but then we can always build a fort here remember our primary goal early game is setting up our forts getting ourselves spread out just enough that we can start building up massive amounts of cultists make sure we have our research done or our recruitment done check out our research still lacking of course because we're just ramping up our second mage now or our third let's see what happens let's check out what happened Janumia. Not sure which one this was. Oh, our profit. Okay. Oh yeah, we've got this one. This is in the bag. This is going to be low attrition. I love how the militia often get in the way of the heavy infantry. Yeah, not too much there. What do we lose? One and one. We're okay with that. Tyradir. Here's the one that's relatively easy, I believe. Yep. Yep. Still working out. Are we losing undead? Two Velites, three undead. Yeah, we're okay with that. Ramp up the defense before we forget. And now our guys didn't suffer any attrition. These guys look like 60, not 50. Still something to be worried about. We have a lot of barbs coming through here. Let's give it a shot. Should be pretty decent. Come over here. Lion Tribe, Warriors. This is nice because it would funnel off this whole area. We don't want to take this out because I don't believe we have enough to take out that consistently. We'd lose a lot of troops, but this is something we'd want to fight for, both of these. So that's something to consider. Now that we have another sensor with all of these guys... No, you're not attacking. There we go. Now we're talking. Now, do we want to take out heavy calves, light calves? We could. It would be expensive, but it would be kind of worth it. So we'll throw maybe six of these guys in. Set them on attack calf. Put him like this. Oh, that's all he can carry. Okay. Set ourselves on another Thaumaturg. If we saw an enemy, we might need to be very careful about grabbing a Grand Thaumaturg because the cost is there. But personally, early game, I just like getting my research up. And this is 11 research versus 17. I like getting my research up and I don't like getting the old men the first year too much. I will when I see combat breaking out. I will. Guaranteed. And in fact, let's get one as a sight searcher. That's what I would do in a multiplayer game. So let's play it as realistically as we can. Ooh. Let's actually get 10 of those guys so we don't get ourselves trapped. Where are we going to send him? Yeah, we're definitely going to send him here. We could actually send him here and help cut down on attrition here. That might actually be something we do so we don't have to grab another. But I'd rather grab another province right now if possible. 70. Oof, that's so tough. But that's a lot we have. These guys are absorbing the lance charge. These guys are throwing their javelins and coming in and and swarming them afterwards. I like my odds. Actually, I'm feeling a little paranoid here. I don't know. I've never, in multiplayer games, my the number of provinces I grab is not nearly as important as fortifying my borders in an intelligent way. For example, I want to jam up Smasia 
because this would be a good fort location. It's got 119 income population. White waste has nothing, so nobody wants to fight me for this. But I would jam this up. I would also get my fort here, fort here. I'd get a fort here or both of these forted, most likely that, if I could. And up here, I'd probably lock up Dural Woods and Sonria. And what I'm looking at here is the paranoia factor. This is going to be easy for like the offshoot of this to take. And then I can put the bigger army here and go here. And then the smaller army here and go here. And this is what you have to do in multiplayer is plan this out. I really want to ensure that I knock these cavalry out because you never know if this turns out to be, you know, 30 heavy cav or something, one of the higher protection heavy calves, like 18, that could turn into a problem. If we get the 16, it'll be a little easier, but I really want to guarantee that I'm not messing myself up here by going with too few troops, if that makes sense. All right, boys, here we go. Oh, crippled unit died. Oh, crippled unit died. Okay, Nern. Let's see what happens here. I think this is our profit. This should not be an issue for us. Yeah, these are the weak heavy infantries, 11 and 12 with spears. Yeah, we're good here. This will be quick. Quick route. Yep. Quick route. That's a good one. How many do we lose? One and two. Not bad. We can do that. Annika. Oh boy. Here's our risky one. This is a risky expansion. Do not recommend this unless, you know, you're forcing it. Oof. Yeah. A lot of 18 protection. I forgot. This is the guy with the acorn, right? So he is going to hurt our undead a little bit. Hopefully I waste his turn with my few sparse line undead. These guys are going to annoy us with a little shots, but these are going to be the problem. This is going to be the real problem. All right. Let's see how they do. Good. Good, they separated from the heavy, or the militia. Good, good, good. Get them surrounded. Take the lance charges on the undead. There we go. Undead can take the lance charges. We want the undead to die. Well, not really, but I mean, we want them to take the majority of the damage and then swarm them and surround them. Yep. There we go. Working out so far. We stay a couple more turns and it'll turn into... Oh, this is great. The undead reaching back here just annoys these archers enough that it actually delays them from focusing on my primary Velites. We're going to lose quite a bit of attrition, but that was a good fight for us. Yes. Okay. There we go. What did we lose? 22 Velites. Oof. That's a little rough, but we lost 25 undead. We don't care. We do not care. Now, what we're going to do is take all these guys, put them on this guy. Can he hold them all? No. That's okay. Send back the Retiarius and then... Give you another Velite. You can take that easily without a problem. Actually, might be able to take that fairly easily. Kind of risky, but that looks like the 16 prot heavy infantry guys. And I really don't like 16 prot into this with a bunch of injuries. So we're going to take the easy point and we're going to take him back to Scalaria. Get him this massive army and then come out and dominate up here. We've got the Grand Thaumaturg coming out. After that, we'll pump out another sensor and cultists so we can get some more armies rolling around. Now, if you have a lot of resources, instead of a ton of Velites, you can always ramp it up to Hastati or Legionnaires, 14 and 14 versus 715. This just cuts the number you get in half, so it's kind of rough to do that. But once I start getting to where I have more undead produced, I'm a little more open to it. These guys I would not pay for because the gold cost way too expensive, but Hastati, not bad. Short swords. I just like the Legionnaires and the Velites a little better, so let's stick with the cheap. That, our Grand Thaumatur is coming out next turn. We've already got this palisade being built. We have 13,000 here. Let's send a gentleman there. Get him another fort. 13,000 here. 13,000 here. Let's just do one at a time. Now that we've got Make sure we have six defense in every province. We're only on turn eight, so we're doing well. For a multiplayer game, we're doing pretty well on this expansion. I don't feel safe with him doing any of this, so let's go... Possibly. I don't like it, though. Let's go up here and see what we can do getting these guys knocked out, and then we'll be here next turn. Our Scalarian guy will be here collecting troops. He can come up while we take this out, and then we can both hit this or split if the armies look small enough. Got our production going. Let's see what happens. All right, let's see how we did on this. I think this is turn eight, Assad. Oh, this is our easy one. Yeah, this is the guarantee, just quick wipe out. I, we're barely going to lose anything here. Have anything interesting? No, no cool items. All right. Now, one thing you want to be doing too, checking every province, looking for those lizard shamans. This is nature, but it doesn't have the astral, so we can't throw them into communions. If we needed to force it and bootleg them in with a slave or a master matrix, we can, but we're really looking for primarily this and this because, and oh, probably here we'll get lizard shamans almost guaranteed, but we're looking around for some kind of 
lizard shaman to break in. So it might look nice, like, oh, you have a bunch of planes. Well, planes aren't what we're looking for. That's not what we want. We primarily want those lizard shamans so we can get ourselves started. Let's get these guys firing. Oh, did he get experience? Yeah, so he got a little leadership boost. Did he also to toughness? Okay. I'll always take that on a commander. Actually, you can put a couple of these on here. Put them on guard commander. Why not? Give ourselves the undead boost. There we go. Now we've got undead and I feel confident with this guy taking out these barbs for sure. So we can actually take this guy. Oof, they ramped right back up, didn't they? 20 to 50. That's rough. Raptors and soulless, but we do have our profit. The tough part about this is they are going to lift off. We're going to say hold and attack flyers. Hold and attack flyers. Put three of them on guarding commander. Yeah, we'll hope that this works a little better for us. And then we'll take these guys out. These guys will be able to do word of stone, take care of them, and then annihilate the undead because the soulless are not what we're concerned about. But I want to make sure that we're prepared. Six defense everywhere. Only on turn nine, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We've already got eleven provinces and a fort going up, and now another fort going up. And now this turn, we'll send somebody over here to get us another fort. Now that we're cranking out these guys again, and a whole heck of a lot of velites. In fact, we might want two separate armies here. There we go. Two more months. Go here. Go here. Heavy infantry, light horse tribe, cav archers, militias, heavy infantry. That's where we'll go. And then next turn, we can meet here. Make sure we're recruiting. Make sure we got our commander. I just like having these commanders to also produce castles. Now, one thing I would like to do is take this out as fast as possible, just because I don't trust barbarians early game or knights, especially not knights and longbowmen. But I really do like getting my cap circle finished. But with these guys, you don't want to produce troops nonstop. I would even stop producing troops as soon as I got enough of the guys to pump out undead. So once we get this ramping up, I like to focus my capital on these. See, he didn't pull a random. He got a random death, which is not beneficial for us. So he can sit here and research, and then I can bring him into a fight if I need him. But when we pop another Grand Thaumaturg as soon as possible, probably after these guys, then if we get one of our water randoms or our air randoms, we can set them off on searching for sites. Let's check it out. All right, let's check out. I think this is turn nine or 10. Research and enchantment just ramped up. So now that gave us access to nothing really big for ourselves. But what we're going to get next turn is raised skeletons, which is nice. That's going to help a lot. So we're looking forward to that. Now that we're ramping up our research a tiny bit, we'll get there. Uh, Mareni, let's see who this is. This was our small original sensor against, yeah, small army. So we've got this. This will be quick. Bump, bump, bump. Yep. Nice try, archers. We lose anybody? Yeah, four. Okay, we can take that. Cloud breakers. This is the one where we're curious about the Raptors. Let's see. We did a good job of jamming our commander in the middle of everybody else. Are these soulless Raptors? That's hilarious. What? What's he got over here? Gems. Okay. Interesting. All right. They lifted off. Let's see where they are. Gotcha. All right. Yep. That could have been our commander. So good thing it wasn't. We'll handle him quickly and then we'll just charge the other guys and take him out. And he, after his word of stone, he should start banishing. Yep. There he goes. Boom. That's the advantage of that profit. Boom. Boom. Yep. And if you look at the profit's fatigue, still decent, despite the fact that he's cast eight, nine spells now. That's what I love about the holy spells. Is he unconscious? Yes, he is. Dumbass. All right. Check that out. We lost one Velite. Excellent. Jareeb. Let's check out our third. Get those barbarians. Hopefully the barbs get annihilated by our javelins. And don't have much of a fight to put up afterwards. Let's see how we do. Yep, nice. We don't mind if we lose a bunch of undead here. We just don't want to lose a bunch of Velites. There we go. Yeah. The ultimate weakness of all barbarians are those javelins. Because arrows, if you come after barbarians with short bows, all you'll do is berserk them and make them more tanky to other forms of damage. These guys don't even have berserk. Oh, jeez sad but the thing that hurts about barbarians is this right here that's people with high protection always go into barbarian fights expecting to like roll through them oh good just undead okay unexpected event dominion minus three go us dysentery all right now we're talking all right turn 10 let's go through here make sure all of our defense is up to snuff so we don't get those random events we might have to lower those or at least reduce what we're researching. Where are we taking this guy? Do we want this? No, but we want this. This was one of our plans to fort up. And this farmland might actually be a better fort province for us. So go here. This guy's already building palisades. This guy's finishing this turn. Already got the defense. We can go here now to get this other fort location. Get this other fort location. Let's see if we need all of what we're bringing. 
we can now stretch these guys back out. Stretch these guys back out. There we go. Yeah, this looks like we're combining forces here. This is a really easy one to take out, though. Good lord. But we'll just make sure we get low attrition here. Commander, normally if I had an army here, I'd go here and produce here. But I like having one here just in between so we can ferry troops from fort to fort to fort. You have no idea how many forts I'll be producing at Scalaria. But as you can see, our income is way better than our moors will ever be. So that's kind of where we're building ourselves from. We've got army commanders. And this would be my specialist. So this would be my general, my general general, and this guy would be my anti-elite army. So looking around for massive elites, this knights and longbowmen, if we gave him these guys as well and these guys, we could take that out. I might actually send this out to get that since I don't see any threats. Obviously, we're not being attacked by nearby provinces, but it's something that I like to hang on to. And now we've got enough castles that I'll be able to produce eventually thaumaturgs and cultists in other provinces. So I would not mind doing this. I do want a turn of cultists. And then I'll get another Thaumaturg. There we go. Probably the last turn or last two turns I'll recruit those. And then I'll just save my money for more forts. This is when I start, like, turn 10, I start forting up a lot more. I obviously already started this one on, what, turn 4 or 5. But I really like to get my forts built up so I can start cranking out massive amounts of ridiculous armies involving the undead. So let's take, let's show you guys how hilarious this is since this is just kind of fun. This is not what I would do in multiplayer. This is the one part that I'm changing, but this is kind of to show you how elite these guys are, but how fast they remove themselves from the game. All right, we got death on marches. Let's see what Shmashia, who is this? Oh, just the heavy infantry, the one that we brought them together. Yeah, this should be pretty quick. Lose like two or three, maybe. Yep, they're surrounded. They got no shot. Yep, what do we lose? Yeah, acceptable, but a little more than I expected, to be honest. And Promised Land. This is where we combine our troops at the Castle Province. Oh yeah, they stand no chance. I think I messed up the commands here. Are these hold? Yep, they are. I just want them on fire. No target. And here's the beauty. Now we can immediately convert this guy to a palisade. We can send ourselves out with a big old army now. We really don't want barbs because that won't be lizard shamans. This might be. This will be. I'm pretty sure. So we'll head here. This is turn 11. We want to make sure we we got this here. Now crank out Temple because that next turn we'll be able to crank out the cultists. And then we can send a Tha Thaumaturg here on his way somewhere else to crank out a lab. But this is a nice little addition for us here. Another good thing to do while you're just waiting for the temple, crank out an assassin and then upgrade this temple if you want two of these per turn, which I highly recommend. Or just early game, just leave it at level one fort. Let's make sure we get all of our provinces up. What did I just see? What is this? Merman. Lovely. We can now go in the water even better. Oh, here. That's an odd place to get mermen, but all right. Let's do it. Yep. Cataphracts. I think we can handle it. This army will just hilariously stomp all over these barbarians for some fun. It'll be fun to see how effective they are against those guys. It's pretty redonkulous. All right, we're getting a Grand Thaumaturg and then cranking out two more cultists. Although, frankly, I won't need any more cultists in this province, so it might be better to just focus on Thaumaturgs now. We don't need many more Velites. We can simply save the money because we're if we wanted to be greedy, these guys are pretty good. We're going to send... Oh, wait. Have these guys on Long Dead. We're going to start ramping up our Long Dead production. And then over here, here. We'll do an assassin just for fun, and then we'll have a bunch of cultists. Normally, I will have an assassin run around kind of like a scout and then just annihilate somebody's army to screw up their expansion if I want to. If I get a chance to mess with them, I will, unless I'm playing a diplomacy angle. I really don't want to piss everybody in the game off at once. All right, turn 11. Make sure we're not missing anything. We are missing. Well, we can give ourselves one more turn. Do we have a commander around? No, we don't. So what we'll want to do after this is probably another sensor. All right, let's see turn 12. This is the first new year. Ultimate Tiffia. What is this? This is our hilarious, yeah, this is our hilarious Retiarius combat where we try to protect these guys from dying by simply getting into combat. Just watch what happens when the Retiarius get in there. First of all, the Javelins are gonna, oh wait, these are mostly undead, right? No, no, these are Javelins, yeah, okay. Some of the undead just slowed down. Look at that Javelin volley. So effective against barbs. And here we go with the Retiarius. There we go. Net them up and slam them down. Yup. Goodbye, barbs. Sorry, pals. Yeah. Now, we had 45. We lost four, so 41. Let's go there and see what's left. Yeah. See, this is the cost. We really lost 39. 
Let's go check out Whispering Wastes, what happened over here. This was our safe expansion with our profit. Yeah, not even gonna watch that. No loss, yeah. Holberg, this was our expansion into our next forted province. Let's see what these guys have. Cataphracts, 16, 16, 15, 15. Not bad. They're tough, but they're gonna get javelin and swarmed. Surrounded, yep, get them. Drop their defense with that harassment penalty. Let's go, fatigue them out, kill them. Easy. Sometimes running the risk of that where you can't kill them for a long time. Yeah, not bad at all. Dovin? A witch was caught. Oh, curse us. Yes, a new famous hero. T heroic toughness. All right, let's throw our defense values up everywhere. The fact that we didn't crank out a bunch of soldiers is why we're so good on the treasury, which gives us the ability to produce another fort. Gives us the ability here to combine forces, guard commander, and then have this gentleman produce a palisades, have this guy go fight over here. He's already producing a palisade. We already got this to six, have our profit come up here and attack here. Not looking bad. But on turn 12, if you look at our multiplayer expansion, it's a lot different than our single player expansion where we're just maximizing provinces. But if you look, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 provinces in a multiplayer expansion. And we have a circular expansion for the most part. Those are easier to defend. We have a fort going up here. 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 And we have a fort going up here. And we still have 300 gold left over and a massive positive income. This is going to start getting better and better and better. When we crank out another one of these thaumaturg, Grand Thaumaturgs this next turn, he's going to go sight searching if he pulls an air or water random. And he's going to go sight searching immediately so we can find good provinces. Good pro sight searching is manual. I still... You know, you can set them on auto site search, but I don't trust it. It seems very inefficient. Our biggest problem this game, I even though it looks okay to the average eye, I would be upset with this expansion, primarily because I'm so far away from the forest, so it's very difficult for me to protect Lizard Shaman if I find them. And I haven't found any diversity expansion yet. So we're really stuck in our, as strong as we are at the undead and the astral magic, we're stuck in it right now. So once we get these forts up, we're going to start cranking out a cultist per turn in every one of the forts and slowly upgrading the forts over time. So they get to level two forts so we can produce two cultists a turn. Once we hit that point in about mm, 10 more turns by the end of the second year, all of these forts, this fort, this fort, this fort, this fort, this fort, this fort, they'll all be tier two. I'll have already ramped up forts here fort here fort here probably a fort here if i get a lizard shaman which it doesn't look like i will but fort here if i get a lizard shaman fort here or here if i get a lizard shaman depending on where i get lizard shamans i'll be forting and i'll have two cultists a turn coming out of there they will start taking over the map so that's the basics of how you expand again everybody else does turn 13 to check how many provinces they have we got 19 on turn 12 so solid expansion even if you're comparing just maximizing your single target but the difference is here you have an army to defend yourself. You have an army being produced regularly. Ooh, nice. Good little Triarius. You have a mass... Well, you had, before we started goofing around against Barbarians, a massive group of these Rediariuses prepared to fight off any elite armies that are coming. You have a, a strong mage and a couple backup mages. You already have the communion available, so you could technically turn this guy into death for Astral 3 in a communion by throwing these guys as slaves in there. You already have a little bit of ability to produce some skeletons, and then, what, three more turns, you'll have the ability to summon quite a few more skeletons. You have a decent early game fight already you have an undead production going and ramping up immediately you have the capability and the money and the income to crank out a whole bunch of undead you're in a really strong position to win this game go out there kick some ass let me know how it goes all right guys and this is a last second reminder please like and subscribe the video but more importantly shoot me a comment down below even if you're normally a shy person don't like to say anything or found the video absolutely perfect let me know what you're thinking if you're one of the guys who's quiet or new and you don't mention anything then i start to assume that the only guys that comment who are obviously fairly experienced players are the only ones that are watching so if you're new let me know even if it's just to say hey reaper shoot me something let me know and i'll see you guys on the next one